Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final session of our uh, 10 talks on the growth of government in the United States. Uh, I will confess that when I started, this seemed like a very big project, and I wasn't at all sure I was man enough to make it to the end, uh, or at least that I had voice enough to make it to the end, but, uh, but here I am still talking, so if I can uh, carry on for one more lecture, then I'll, uh, I'll be ready to make one of those uh, declarations like the chief of the Nez Perce tribe made. Uh, in my case, I will lecture no more again. <laughs> uh, that might be a little hard promise for me to keep, but uh, at all events, for the time being, it'll, it'll put me at rest. Uh, what I want to do uh, this time is uh, give some consideration to uh, the most recent uh, crisis episode that uh, might be viewed as fitting the mold of the ones I've uh, discussed in the, in the past uh, few days, uh, and then to uh, <coughs> consider uh, explicitly uh, what we might expect to happen in the future in light of our understanding of what has happened in the past. Uh, those of us who uh, care a lot about history and, and are so audacious as to even uh, stand up and try to teach it, uh, often uh, try to persuade uh, students that, that uh, this is a worthwhile subject, that uh, it uh, can do a lot to help you uh, understand the world and to give you a better appreciation of what is going to happen in the future. As I said in my very first lecture, there are no laws of history, so we, we can never know for certain what uh, will happen in the future. But uh, what we can learn uh, from the study of history, uh, if combined with sound theory, is uh, that we can make a, a pretty good probabilistic forecast uh, about what future patterns will hold uh, and expect uh, that some of the patterns we've seen in the past to provide uh, useful guides for shaping our, our expectations. Uh, to, to illustrate this, uh, I want to start off uh, right now by uh, giving you some excerpts from an interview I gave uh, in uh, September of 19, uh, excuse me, of uh, 2001, uh, in fact, on the September 20th, uh, which was uh, just uh, nine days after the, uh, the dreadful uh, events of the terrorist hijacking and the collapse of the buildings in New York City with so much loss of life. And uh, I, was, uh, I was approached uh, by Michael Lynch uh, of Reason Magazine and uh, who wanted to interview me, uh, uh, given what uh, seemed to be the terrorism crisis that we were plunged into at that time, and, and uh, asked me some questions about uh, what I expected to happen, given my study of crises in the past. And uh, so this was an occasion for me, in a sense, to take a test uh, to see whether, in fact, it is true as I'd always insisted to students, that uh, knowing something about how history seems to have operated is a good guide to the future. And uh, I, I answered uh, the questions put uh, as follows. Uh, there were a number of them. I'm not going to read the whole interview, but it, it did appear in Reason Online. Uh, Lynch said, what ought we to look for this time? And I said, we can expect thousands of reservists to be called to active duty and taken away from their ordinary jobs. We can expect the assignment of military forces to some unprecedented duties. Uh, it appears that some military units are going to be used for domestic police activities. Uh, it is clearly going to be the case that the FBI will become far more active in surveillance activities. The government will mount a variety of overseas actions requiring the armed forces and perhaps a number of civilian employees 
to attempt to kill, uh, to disable, or to damage what are taken to be terrorist camps, facilities, and cadres. It is also fairly clear that the government is going to have to bail out the airline industry and maybe the insurance industry. When the government takes large-scale unprecedented actions of this sort, unanticipated consequences always occur. Then the government has to expand even further to deal with those consequences. Lynch asked later, what's the nature of the coming crisis? And I replied, the whole concept of wiping out terrorism is completely misguided. It simply can't be done. Terrorism is a simple act for any determined adult to perpetrate, no matter what kind of security measures are taken. And I suspect that after the government finishes making its show of force in the next few weeks, uh, it will only inspire new acts of terrorism, if not immediately, then eventually. And finally, he said, what do you expect in terms of Leviathan at the end of the day? To which I replied, the ultimate result will be an enlargement of the Big Brother state. We were moving that way already. This will accelerate it. Well, I'll let you be the judge of uh, how well my forecasts have held up to this point, but uh, in my own estimation, uh, I hit every single nail on the head. Now, maybe any sensible person might have come to the same expectations that I expressed in that interview, but I don't think so. Uh, and uh, so I think that what has been happening in the past two years it has, in fact, uh, uh, mimicked in many ways uh, the experience of previous crises. Obviously, each one has its own uh, uh, specific details. Uh, no two are exactly the same. And so uh, what the government does in any given crisis is always a, a, a little different from what it's done uh, in another. Uh, but uh, again, there are patterns uh, that occur again and again and again. There is a kind of internal political logic that creates those patterns, that brings them into being, and there is an ideological underpinning that makes possible the working through of these patterns on each, each occasion. As I argued in my book, uh, there have been crises throughout history, but they didn't always work like the ones of the past century. Uh, they require a certain ideological context in order for them to work uh, as they have more recently. Uh, that ideological context still exists, uh, despite what people seem to think for a while in the 80s and 90s about having uh, put the status to, to rout. Uh, nothing of the sort, of course, happened. And uh, as I told many of the people espousing those views in the 80s and 90s, you're, you're just indulging in wishful thinking. If you think somehow we've won the battle, against the statists and, and got them on the run, uh, that the masses uh, could be turned around on a dime by the simplest crisis or even by a bogus crisis. And uh, the politicians will, will quickly come running to exploit the opportunities of a crisis. Well, what did they do this time around? Uh, very quickly after the attacks of uh, September 11. Uh, the, the President Bush asked Congress for an emergency appropriation, uh, apparently aimed uh, largely at, at, at just giving $20 billion, more or less, uh, to, to New York City uh, to, for the purpose of uh, making repairs of the damage there. Uh, Congress responded not, not by agreeing to the President's request, but by doubling it and appropriating $40 billion to what amounted to a, an emergency slush fund. Um, the airline industry, which uh, was plunged into, into uh, uh, even more money losing uh, by the fallback of its, uh, of its demand uh, 
after the uh, attacks, uh, received a $5 billion appropriation uh, for cash subsidies and uh, a $10 billion authorization for uh, the federal government to make uh, loan guarantees if the airline companies got banks or other lenders to help prop them up uh, during their hard times. Uh, Congress created the Air, Tra Air Transportation Stabilization Board, uh, which uh, was to oversee the uh, dispensing of this loot uh, to uh, airline companies, many of which were, were uh, on the verge of uh, going bankrupt anyhow at their own initiative. And, and so they were probably happy to have this uh, crisis come along and provide a, provide a pretext for subsidizing them uh, when the market uh, was already telling them to close up shop. Uh, Airport security, uh, almost everybody decided, obviously needed to be nationalized. Uh, at that time, the airline companies, uh, uh, under the supervision of the FAA and, and in accordance with FAA rules, uh, along with uh, the airports, were, uh, were managing these uh, baggage checks and, uh, and uh, uh, searches of passengers and and since the terrorists had got on board as passengers and carried out their their hijacking, uh, everybody panicked and real and concluded that uh, uh, we 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 couldn't rely on private employees to perform this cr critical uh, security task. And for some reason, even though everybody knows perfectly well that when anything is moved from the private sector to the public sector, it's done worse, not better. They all somehow believed that th this was completely different because this was called security or, or policing, uh, and obviously we don't want private policing. Again, flying in the face of the fact that the great bulk of the real policing going on in the country right now is being done by private employees as opposed to these make-believe thugs who wear uniforms and steal people's property and arrest them for non-crimes. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the government proceeded to nationalize airport security checks and, and created something called the Transportation Security Administration, uh, just recently transferred to the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security after it was created. Uh, one and one-half months after uh, the hijackings, Congress passed something called the USA Patriot Act. Cute. Uh, what an acronym. Where do they get these geniuses? Okay. Uh, this uh, was uh, a statute of more than 400 pages, which, uh, according to members of Congress, nobody in the Congress read prior to voting on it, uh, not, not that they often read much of the legislation they pass. That's, that in itself is not unusual, of course, but, uh, but this, uh, this was an especially important law, and they clearly rushed it through. Uh, uh, these 400-plus pages of the law uh, consist in very large part of uh, uh, amendments to existing laws, uh, which had been sought and prepared already, uh, uh, particularly by the Department of Justice, which has been seeking to expand its powers for many years uh, and to uh, give itself more power uh, to spy on people and to, and to collect and exchange information in a whole variety of ways that were forbidden, at least officially forbidden. Uh, one, one always wants to take with a grain of salt these rules that are supposedly imposed on the FBI or the CIA or the other intelligence agencies because it's not as if they necessarily feel obliged to follow them. But uh, at all events, they did have some constraints they didn't like and had been trying to get loosened. And they uh, are smart guys. They know that when a certain time comes, they can then 
come forward with what they, they want and, uh, and have a much better chance of getting congressional approval. So that's what they did in the USA Patriot Act. Uh, and the upshot was that uh, the uh, legal authority to conduct surveillance uh, was uh, greatly uh, increased. Uh, whole new categories of criminal were defined, uh, such as domestic terrorist. Uh, but a domestic terrorist uh, was defined in the law so, so loosely uh, as to uh, be applied to, to anyone committing virtually any crime, uh, so long as uh, the authorities uh, somehow linked it uh, that's a that's a wonderful word. We're always seeing things or people that are linked to terrorism, and uh, it behooves us to always say how linked how says who, uh, because it's a, it's an all-purpose claim uh, that can be trotted out and is trotted out all the time nowadays uh, to uh, to cover what they're doing. Anyhow, these uh, domestic terrorists are now uh, uh, to, be, to be dealt with harshly, and uh, special measures are to be taken to, to ferret them out, uh, including so-called sneak-and-peek uh, search of people's uh, premises. Uh, normally, uh, before uh, police uh, uh, of any kind can, can, can break into your house or your car, they need a search warrant, at least uh, under the Constitution, it would appear that they should have one. Uh, and, uh, and often they do get them. I mean, they're not that tough to get. All you have to do is uh, to take somebody from the prosecutor's office and have him waltz into a judge and tell some lies, and he waltzes out with a search warrant. So uh, it's not as if it's a big burden on the police to get search warrants. Uh, but it's not one they like anyhow. So a sneak and peek search allows them to, to, to come onto your premises unannounced, and furthermore, even after they've conducted their search, to not tell you for months if they choose not to tell you. Now what that means is that if they come and take something that wasn't even stipulated as what they were looking for in the search warrant, you have no way to know that they've exceeded the warrant. Uh, you have no uh, opportunity to go before a judge and, uh, and ask that that evidence be excluded from any legal proceedings in which they might uh, seek to prosecute you. Uh, you have no way to offer an explanation of why you might be in the possession of something in a lawful way uh, that they might uh, have linked with some crime, uh, including terrorism. So sneak and peek uh, search warrants uh, were a kind of authority that certainly took away uh, some uh, protection that people thought they had at least against uh, unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, the law authorized so-called one-stop search warrants. In the past, if you wanted to search somebody's house in, in Philadelphia, you had to go to a judge in the, in the, in the area with jurisdiction over that house and get the search warrant. And if, and if the person who lived in that house also had an apartment in Miami and you wanted to search that too, you had to go to a judge in Miami and go through the motions again to get another search warrant. One-stop search warrants allow you to do this once and then to search a person's property anywhere he happens to go or anywhere he happens to be living or staying. Um, wiretap rules were, were loosened and made quite undiscriminating. Uh, internet tap rules were made uh, looser and undiscriminating. Uh, the uh, FBI's use of these uh, filters, uh, which they start out calling carnivore, another one of their blunders, uh, <laughs> you wonder, you know, there must be a guy somewhere in charge of giving the original names to all these programs and he's the dumbest guy in the agency, uh, and uh, he comes up with these real doozies, which the minute they get out in the press just cause them no end of grief because they're, they're all too suggestive, aren't they? Carnivore, uh, being aimed in the direction of human beings, they might as well have called it cannibal or you know? uh, 
Uh, not, not what you want your FBI to be doing to you. Uh, but, but at all events, uh, these, uh, these electronic filters are now implanted at uh, Internet service providers, and, and when you and I send our subversive emails back and forth, uh, uh, as, as long as we keep, keep uh, putting in little catchphrases like, we must do as Osama says, uh, <laughs> they filter that information right out and add us to their databanks. Okay? So... Uh, the, uh, the, the Internet is now completely vulnerable to these people's uh, blundering uh, filters uh, for everybody. It's completely undiscriminating. They don't have to have identified Mark Thornton as a potential terrorist. Uh, his email's passing through whatever ISP he's using, and it's all being uh, uh, subjected, along with the other fish in that ocean, to being taken out by the net they're using. A uh, number of uh, provisions were added under the Patriot Act uh, to, uh, to confiscate property. The government has discovered uh, in the past 20 years that confiscations are good and more confiscations are better. So uh, under the, the guise of uh, stopping money laundering, uh, you'd think, well, money laundering, they must be talking about money passed back and forth in support of terrorism. But in this regard, as in many others in the Patriot Act, there's no confinement of these, these provisions to terrorist-related activities. They're generally applicable, so that regardless of the kind of crime the government might uh, pretend to be investigating, it can still go ahead and confiscate property. And in fact, it's been doing so. There was an article just a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times reporting a dispute between the State Department and uh, the Justice Department. The State Department was reporting that a number of foreigners were complaining because uh, the Justice Department had been confiscating assets uh, of foreign banks. <laughs> And these foreigners doing some kind of business in the United States did not appreciate just having their assets snatched. Uh, and so they were com making diplomatic complaints, and that pressure was being relayed to the Department of Justice, uh, which was telling its colleagues to go to hell. So the, it's already an issue. That is, anyone who studied things like this knows you, if you create authority for one ostensible purpose, but you don't strictly con, confine it to that purpose by clear language, the first thing will happen is that it'll be used across the board. And ultimately, it'll be abused and it'll be used for political purposes. We've seen it again and again and again. And this, this anti-terrorism legislation, so-called, is tailor-made to be abused in that fashion. The uh, FBI uh, pretends to have made drastic changes in its mode of operation back in the mid-70s after revelations were made at a considerable length in the Congress uh, having to do with the so-called uh, COINTELPRO uh, operations of the FBI <coughs> between 1956 and 1971. COINTELPRO is an acronym, and a really <coughs> ugly acronym at that, uh, for counterintelligence programs. Uh, and it's also an inaccurate acronym because uh, although uh, the pretext for these programs at the FBI was to find out about communist spies operating in the United States, the, the authority was quickly expanded and extended so that it wasn't just gathering information. After a while, it was actively intervening, not just to plant agents, uh, not just to plant uh, agents provocateur, uh, not just to plant misinformation, or not just to intimidate people involved in some subversive activity, but, but to uh, spy on, disrupt, and to... Uh, 
discourage, up to and including discouragement by collaborating with their murderers, uh, people engaged in various anti-government policy activities, as people who were opposing uh, government foreign or domestic policies. Many of these people were radical groups, socialist groups, communist groups, uh, some of them not so radical groups, like the American Friends Service Committee of the Quakers, uh, which was very active in anti-war activities in the 60s especially. And I suppose they still are, for that matter. But uh, they were subjected to uh, dirty tricks uh, by the, the evil geniuses at the COINTEL PRO. A uh, great deal has been written about all of this, uh, and supposedly when it was revealed by the church committee and by other committees of Congress in the early 1970s, the FBI changed all its rules to ensure that they wouldn't engage in these kinds of actions again. Well, all right, if you want to, you can choose to believe they stopped. But at all events, just recently, the attorney general has decided officially that they'll resume, that they'll once again start monitoring and collecting information on political and religious groups. So they would have us believe that all they're doing is you know, sending guys into a few mosques to make sure that the, the terrorists aren't in there uh, concocting uh, acts of terrorism. But, uh, but we all know that's not all they're going to be doing. Uh, the uh, Patriot Act provided for a lot of information sharing that used to be against the official rules between the FBI and the CIA and the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, and in fact, uh, increasingly in the past two years, the Pentagon has become very much engaged in what you might call uh, domestic police work. Uh, this is something that historically American tradition regarded as extremely dangerous, and we thought the Army should stick to making war and should stay out of policing. Uh, but uh, because of particularly the drug war drawing military forces into cooperation with domestic police, uh, people have grown used to this now, so it was a, an easy thing to, to add to that kind of activity under the Patriot Act. There's a lot more in the Patriot Act, as I say. It's more than 400 pages long, and, and the language being what it is, it's a very difficult to decipher what it really means. Uh, a lot of it just says, you know, Section 421 of the Law of September 9th, 1979, is amended to remove the word which in line 7 and add the word including, uh, things like that. So... It's, you really have to put a lot of work in and almost be a specialist. Lawyers at the Department of Justice, okay? and, and it's written that way not, not just because that's an easy and technically apt way to do it, but it's also because nobody else will know what they're doing. It's very difficult even for journalists who want to write about this to know what power was actually altered or changed by this kind of law. So... Uh, what I've told you about, we're pretty sure is there. <laughs> uh, other things are there, too, and we could indeed have, have a whole course on the Patriot Act if we were so inclined. The, uh, the attacks uh, of September 11 gave new impetus to increases in the defense budget that were already beginning to be uh, made and bigger ones planned for the future. When uh, the Bush administration took office, uh, they they said they would try uh, to to add some fifty billion dollars a year to the rate of defense spending every year uh, by the time their first term ended. Well, of course they're 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 double that already as of as of next year, and uh, so uh, they must be very pleased with their their ability to jack up the Pentagon budget. Now, you might say, um, what does this have to do with terrorism? After all, the, the Army, Navy, and Air Force didn't do a lot to defend us from the acts of terrorism on September 11th. 
And indeed, should future terrorist acts be attempted, it's hard to see how the Army, Navy, and Air Force would be of much good in preventing them. <laughs> but uh, those military services are very good at somehow transporting munitions to Afghanistan uh, or Iraq or any other part of the world and, uh, and, and uh, carrying out aerial bombardments of whoever happens to be down below. That's what they know how to do. So, as I forecasted right after the hijackings, that's what they're going to do. They'll do what they know how to do, drop bombs. So they dropped bombs fairly quickly on Afghanistan, and they've continued to drop them ever since. Uh, the, uh, the Afghans shrewdly uh, tried to get out of harm's way, and so they've, by this time, found ways to pretty much stay out of harm's way, although not all the villagers and people driving around innocently in vehicles have been equally successful. But, uh, but they have dropped a lot of munitions on Afghanistan, and uh, I'm sure they'll be doing that for a long time to come. So that's, uh, that's good, steady work. And uh, meanwhile, of course, we've had this new war on, on Iraq. Uh, which we all witnessed and saw coming and argued about the lunacy of, knowing it wouldn't have any effect whatsoever on what was about to happen. Uh, I, I felt very much akin to the people in the late 1930s who saw World War II coming. They saw how horrible it would be, and they knew they could do nothing to stop it. So, it, uh, for me, for me, it was personally painful to, to await that catastrophe and then to see it happen as it did and as, as it is continuing to happen now. And uh, we, many of us fear, of course, that it's just <coughs> one chapter in a whole book of catastrophes that may be carried out along similar lines. But the defense establishment, thank goodness, will now be much better funded to do its part in dropping cluster bombs on cities all over Central Asia. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Uh, the public opinion changed overnight like that. Uh, government had grown, at one level at least, somewhat unpopular in the 80s and 90s. It used to be back before the mid-60s, uh, if you ask people questions like, how much do you trust the, the, the government officials in Washington to do the right thing? You know, about two-thirds of the people would say, a lot or somewhat. And then, with the war in Vietnam and Watergate and all the rest of it, uh, government uh, didn't get so many approving answers from the public. And in and with uh, the Reagan people coming on, bad-mouthing government, and, and uh, people rediscovering, some said, the virtues of the free market, uh, these public opinion polls showed less and less uh, ostensible public approval of, of government and its ability to, to do the right thing and to do it in a competent way. Uh, so that uh, if we had asked that question, uh, let's say, in uh, the summer of 2001, as indeed some polling organizations did, uh, they found that only about a third of the respondents said, well, they'll do the right thing uh, most of the time, or at least some of the time. They, we, we, we have quite a bit of trust in them. Well, as soon as hijackers come here, and knock down two big buildings and kill thousands of people, the public suddenly has renewed trust in government. <laughs> that was not a typo I spoke. <laughs> they have the old level of high trust in government all at once because two buildings have been demolished. Now you go figure. Okay? I've got it figured out myself. Uh, I know how people respond to heightened apprehension. They turn to their protector. And modern Americans turn to government as their protector. It's not their protector of last resort. It's their protector of first resort. 
They demand immediately that the federal government do something. And they expect that it will somehow. It's as if every time, the fresh time, it's like, it's like uh, uh, the old Peanuts cartoon with kicking the football, you know. Every time it's pulled away at the last moment and Charlie Brown falls on his butt. But you know, it's like a shock every time. Uh, the American people, every time they, they kick and miss that football of protection that's jerked away from them by the government, but they think it's going to be there. Every single crisis they run thinking that football of protection is going to be held right there for them to kick. So uh, public opinion switched uh, tremendously, very quickly, and it has remained. Uh, at a high level, uh, it's fallen back a little bit, but it remains at a very high level of approving government, of trusting government, of approving what's called the job the president is doing. All of these measures of how people feel about the state uh, were transformed for the betterment of state functionaries by the catastrophe of September 11. Okay. Well, <clears throat> uh, Government officials, being no dummies in this respect, knew they had a great opportunity. And so they, along with countless opportunists in the private sector, <laughs> rushed to Washington, D.C. to exploit those opportunities the crisis had created, whether it was to get a new contract to sell your, your security gizmo to the FBI or whether it was... Uh, an opportunity to increase the Pentagon budget or give more power to the FBI, uh, to the president, you name it. It was an opportunity uh, for all those neocon intriguers who had been trying to rule the world for 30 years and hadn't quite got there yet. It was a great opportunity indeed because now they were able to make the president their total puppet uh, and to use him as the... Uh, as the uh, ostensible actor uh, in carrying out this uh, 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 plan to uh, conquer first the Middle East and then to intimidate anyone else in the world who got out of line. So they, they set in motion very quickly. They were the best prepared of all, so well prepared that it makes you wonder. Um, one thing that came of this after a year or so was passage of the Homeland Security Act uh, on uh, November the 25th, 2002. And uh, this was uh, a typical government uh, make-believe uh, statute. It, it's almost 500 pages long, very complicated, and consists mainly of just uh, reorganizing a lot of the organization chart. Uh, a bunch of existing government agencies were now brought under one umbrella and made uh, subsidiaries, as it were, of one big firm instead of being uh, separate and competitive. Uh, one upshot of this, of course, will be that uh, they'll have more budget clout now acting as a unit than they used to have when they were to some extent fighting against one another in the bureaucratic process. Uh, so they'll all end up better off is my uh, expectation in terms of how much loot they extract from the taxpayers. Uh, they, there are about 170,000 employees uh, in the Homeland Security Department right now and I expect that number to grow. Uh, the act also uh, empowered uh, these people with uh, a much new authority, uh, extending to some extent what had already been done in the Patriot Act, the uh, power to collect uh, information on persons and organizations and to, to mine existing databases uh, and, to, and to bring all that information together into one gigantic de facto database uh, was, uh, was, was given to, to the government. Uh, they started out calling this Total Information Awareness, TIA. Uh, and again, it was that, that really dim-witted fellow uh, back in the basement who came up with that idea. Uh, uh, 
Well, Melvin, it's a little too Orwellian sounding, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, so they decided to, without changing the acronym, to just call it Terrorism Information Awareness. And, of course, that, that solved all the problems because just saying the word terrorism always solves all these problems. It's all we have to do. It's like a mantra. We just utter the mantra and all our woes disappear. All our powers are magnified. Uh, there, uh, I don't know if any, it occurred to anyone that it's also uh, T-I-A, Tia, that's the Spanish word for ant. You know, like you kind of get the feeling of an old lady hectoring you, uh, but uh, maybe that's just my own fevered imagination that calls that to mind. Uh, <laughs> You know, that, that relative who wants to give you a kiss at a family get-together and you don't want her to kiss you, <laughs> Tia Maria, uh, she's the one, yes. Uh, the Homeland Security Act extended the limits, uh, or I, I beg your pardon, uh, put new limits on what you could find out through a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request. That, that, that's the mechanism that we've been using for the last several decades to try to extract information that the government holds. And sometimes it works, you know. You sometimes eventually get a little information out of them if you're patient and willing to wait a long time, although it may have been blacked out in large part so that it's still near useless to you. But uh, there are now more limits on what you can find out by FOIA requests. Uh, and uh, government advisory committees have received new power to meet secretly. And uh, I don't know how much help that's going to be in uh, putting down terrorism, but it's probably going to help Vice President Cheney stay out of jail a little longer. Uh, <laughs> there were new health emergency powers uh, in the Act, uh, powers for the government to quarantine people or even to force them to have vaccinations against various diseases, whether they wanted to be vaccinated or not, uh, and uh, new centralization of surveillance data was provided uh, so that, again, we've made the Patriot Act even stronger. Now, of course, you all know, I'm sure, that there, there, there's a separate movement to pass Patriot II or, you know, Son of Patriot or some such act that the <laughs> Justice Department has cooked up. And when, it, when that was leaked, they denied it. Uh, of course, by that time, the New York Times was holding a copy in its sweaty little hands. <laughs> so it was hard to deny that they had done this, but they, they, they recommended that we not take seriously what they had done. So don't worry. Uh, but that's all in addition to what the Homeland Security Act has done to increase the government's power to spy on us and to uh, trade the information around among themselves, uh, but to, to keep us from knowing what it is they're doing. Uh, so that in case they might say, get one of those credit reports that we all know are impeccably accurate, and use that information in a way that would be harmful to you, based completely on error, uh, well, at least this way, you'll never know that that's how you came to your misfortune. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the president's request uh, for defense money for fiscal year 2004 is for just under $400 billion. Uh, that's up from uh, fiscal year uh, 2000, just four years earlier when it was uh, uh, 294, including the nuclear program. So uh, that, that's more than a, a one-third increase in four fiscal years. But, of course, the $400 billion that's being requested does not count the $75 billion in the separate uh, request to pay for the war in Iraq. Because when the Pentagon gets money to make war, uh, well, that's not really to make war. And if it does make war, then it has to have extra money. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into the complications of what the money is for if there's no war, because that's all classified. 
Part of this $75 billion uh, request for the war in Iraq is, uh, is more than $3 billion for more airline bailout. And, uh, and we'll never know how that got in there, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, some $8 billion for what looks for all the world like bribes to selected uh, governments in the Middle East and Central Asia, Turkey, Israel, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, of course, with the big, big payoffs going to the usual suspects uh, who were already getting large amounts of foreign aid and military assistance aid before this little add-on here. So these are all uh, some of the events that have, uh, have occurred uh, after the uh, terrible events of September 11, 2001, and, and I think they are sufficient to make the point I made in general terms at the beginning of this talk, which is that this crisis is following the same general pattern as previous ones. Not only is government responding by doing a lot of the things that, that seem plausible, uh, increasing funds for intelligence and war making and what have you, uh, but it's also using the pretext of the war on terrorism to endow itself with new powers and new funding for a lot of actions and activities and programs that really have nothing to do with wars on terrorism. So what we're seeing is the exploitation of crisis by opportunists of all kinds. Uh, and every one of these things uh, will create a constituency that will fight to the death to keep whatever it's recently acquired, uh, whether it's new power, uh, new flow of funds, or anything else, new jobs. Okay. All right. Uh, I I want to now, uh, in the time that remains to me, uh, look back over what I've said in the past week and, and uh, see if we can uh, learn from history again in a, in a little more general way. Uh, I, government grew a lot in the past in the United States, uh, and, and when I think in capsule form about why that happened, uh, uh, I, I tend to see two uh, distinct, at least conceptually distinct, sources of the growth of government, and, uh, and, and I see them as interacting. Uh, in a paper I've just recently written, I invented uh, new acronyms. Uh, that's what the world needs. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not even sure... That they're, that they're any good at all because uh, they're okay when written down, but when I talk about them, they seem to be pronounced the same. So <laughs> it's a really ill choice of acronyms, it turns out. But, uh, uh, but uh, this stands uh, for structural, ideological, political. This for crisis, ideological, political. Uh, what I see as having happened in our history is that uh, a number of uh, structural changes took place as the e economy developed uh, going back to the 19th century. Industrialization, urbanization, uh, uh, technological changes, improvements of uh, communications and transportation, and so on and so on. Uh, all, of, all of these things had the effect of... Uh, of both uh, creating progress and of creating a lot of people who, at least in the short term, were losers or were put at a disadvantage somehow by the way things were developing and who turned to the political process to try to get some relief or to fight back against those they took to be the, the responsible parties for their plight so that uh, these structural developments over time altered the configuration of political forces in the perpetual struggle to redistribute power and wealth that uh, goes under the shorthand politics. Uh, at the same time, they gave rise to changes in ideology. Um, and uh, along with uh, 
the uh, ideological changes that, that seem to be endogenous or, or created by these very events uh, in some way, uh, the United States was subject to a variety of ideological influences uh, by virtue of ideas that were imported from abroad, especially from Europe. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time talking about specific ideas brought over from, from Germany, uh, everything from you know, socialism to uh, the idea of uh, letting uh, uh, academically well-educated experts take charge of uh, doing what had been done via markets. So uh, all, of, all of these kinds of developments, uh, st structural, uh, ideological, political changes, had the effect of tending uh, to produce bigger government uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, but then every once in a while, particularly after progressive ideology had become the dominant uh, ideology of the country at the beginning of the 20th century, Every once in a while, a, a crisis would come along, such as the World Wars, or the Great Depression, or the, the events of the uh, Johnson-Nixon years. A and during those crisis times, uh, we would have, a, a, as it were, superimposed on these structural changes, uh, additional forces brought to bear. And uh, they, of course, uh, had their own ideological and political effects, uh, and they tended to to work toward augmenting government, and, and indeed augmenting it abruptly, creating these bursts of government growth superimposed on what had been a slower trend toward bigger government uh, beforehand. Now, not only can we distinguish uh, these two separate uh, categories that are promoting the growth of government, but, but we can recognize, and what I, I've tried to argue in my book and since is that they're not independent and, and we shouldn't certainly shouldn't see these as just aberrations or or stochastic events or or blips or something like that uh, they uh, work as they do because of what's been going on here if we hadn't had all these structural changes of the late 19th and early 20th century then the way Americans responded to World War I would have been different so these things affect how the crises play out, but in turn, when a crisis does occur, it alters the nature of how these structural changes are operating to bring about more, more government. Uh, in a sense, we, we get these ratchet phenomena in which government may be growing slowly uh, for these kinds of reasons. Then we have a big growth because of crisis, and then a retrenchment, but a partial retrenchment. So even if we have uh, the same structural forces as before, it's at a higher level. Uh, but very often, it's not the same as before. Indeed, it may be that the only reason it appears to be the same as before is that we had this crisis, as it were, to keep certain things going. It may have been that it's wrong to keep projecting this forever, and it might have leveled off at some lower level, but for this crisis, it pushed it up. Or it may be that afterward the trend is not uh, the same as before normally. It, it's at some higher rate. So there are interrelations. Uh, the crises uh, operate, uh, they, they end, but they affect the workings of the post-crisis normal uh, events and how they tend to enlarge the uh, scope of government. What, what happened in our case is by the time we get to, to uh, the end of World War II, the, the country has uh, gone sufficiently in the direction of, of massive government, uh, pervading many different aspects of society, and it has gone so far as to, by that time, as to virtually... Uh, uh, eliminate, in the case of the Constitution, uh, any check on the growth of government, or in the case of ideology, to greatly weaken the kind of ideological forces that, that held government somewhat in check in the 19th century, that those kinds of fundamental constraints on the growth of government count for very little in the past 55 or 60 years. 
So we've, we've been living in a world uh, since World War II where the status quo is a kind of carnival of rent-seeking uh, by one and all, uh, and the uh, proliferation of rent-seeking interest groups organized for political action uh, has been greatly expanded, especially during that Johnson-Nixon episode where all these people were mobilized by civil rights and anti-war crusades, and then that spread out and spilled over onto any number of new interest groups, environmentalist groups, feminist groups, uh, gr uh, groups representing the elderly and the Chicanos, and, and it just goes on and on and on. Okay? So... So we now have this a gigantic jungle filled with rent-seeking beasts of various colorations, uh, and we've had a continued development of ideology, uh, not in the classic socialist direction, but in what you might call the soft collectivist uh, direction, uh, the, the, the direction that uh, Tocqueville warned against when he talked about the kind of despotism that democracies would arrive at eventually, this kind of uh, nanny state, uh, therapeutic, paternalistic uh, activity that more and more pervades uh, the, the actions uh, of government uh, whenever it's not engaged in, in explicit death and destruction through the armed forces and the police, uh, and sometimes even when it is, strange to say. So... So we now, we now have, have reached this situation, which I, I must confess seems like a, a very unpromising one for friends of liberty. Uh, our liberties have not all been totally crushed yet. Uh, and so the question is, as we look forward, can we expect anything to change in the process that has operated for some 100 years to bring us to where we are today? Uh, my own answer is, uh, is no. I, I don't see anything about how the process has operated uh, that has changed for the better, that tells me it's not going to work this way anymore. Uh, now, of course, I may be wrong. I may be totally cockamamie in my understanding of how we got here to begin with. So maybe there's no, no force to my argument. But if my argument has a measure of validity, then the only way we can expect the future to be different is that something about the process, as it's operated in the past, will be different in the future. And frankly, I don't see any element of it that I, I, I see operating differently, at least so far as my vision can penetrate into the fog of the future. Now... There have been many people, of course, who, who have, uh, have imagined that, uh, that counterforces not only exist, but that they are actually becoming stronger. So I, uh, I'm quite prepared to consider uh, some of these uh, potential or actual counterforces. And, uh, and one of them is, uh, is one I've always regarded as uh, extremely far-fetched, but nonetheless, it, it, it has a, a very good uh, a paternity, uh, as it were, and that is that the whole system, you know, this political economy of, uh, of uh, rent-seeking, nannyism, pervasive government, uh, could just crack up. There could be some massive meltdown or... It would break apart somehow. And actually, I, 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 I think that is the expectation you get from reading Mises. And Mises wrote a lot about the mixed economy. And what he wrote is that it has an, an internal logic. Uh, the interventionists uh, set out to do something uh, by intervening in the market, but by virtue of interventionism and what it is, uh, they're unable to achieve their objective, and furthermore, uh, when in the course of carrying out their intervention, they create even more problems and difficulties. So then they intervene in new ways to take care of the new problems they've created or to cut off what seems to be interfering with the realization of their first intervention, uh, and they enter into a kind of spiraling intervention uh, 
uh, every, every element of which fails, and ultimately they, they arrive at a kind of a full-fledged socialism and uh, for perfectly good Misesian reasons, we know that can't work, and, and that will crack up. It'll break up, and uh, Mises uh, argued that uh, at that point uh, the system would, would revert to laissez-faire idiotically illogical interventionism until the system eventually reaches the point where it's so absurd that we have a total breakdown. The good news, of course, is that then we have laissez-faire and everything is wonderful. (laughs) So some of us might say it's an acceptable price to pay. Uh, That's a possibility. That's a possibility. I uh, I won't say it has probability zero. Uh, I, I personally uh, have argued, and the paper I'm floating around right now, and we'll, we'll present this September at the Mon Pelerin meetings, I argue that, that that is not what I expect to happen. Uh, I do uh, expect that there will be accumulating idiocies and that the interventions will create more problems and elicit more intervention to deal with them and so forth, uh, I simply part company with Mises uh, at the final step. Uh, I don't think there will be a crack up. I think there will be perhaps a fallback at some point. There will be ad hoc repair efforts. There will be there will be limited concessions. There will be opening up enough room for maneuver in the market that entrepreneurs can can at least keep the ship afloat. Uh, and I think that might well happen at some point. We may have some ebb and flow of the, the um, Leviathan that has developed. Uh, it, it, it may actually move back at some point rather than relentlessly forward. Uh, I just don't expect the, uh, the system to crack up and revert to laissez-faire uh, because... Uh, It seems to me that uh, ideologically, uh, modern Americans and modern Western Europeans and and, and modern just about everybody else, uh, uh, these people are unwilling to live in a free society. They they don't want individual responsibility. Uh, They can't tolerate it, and they can't live with it. And so I just don't think they will tolerate the kind of individual responsibility that is part and parcel of a genuinely free society. And I... I'm not sure how they could ever be brought to a position where they would tolerate it either. So if you can imagine that, I'd, I'd be happy to be educated about it. But nonetheless, that, that is the, the main constraint I see, keeping the system from ever going back toward a very free <laughs> condition. Now, another counterforce that uh, some people have put a lot of weight on is, uh, is what you might call Tebow-type competition, uh, named after uh, Charles Tebow, T-I-E-B-O-U-T, uh, a man who, uh, who used to teach economics at the University of Washington and, and, and uh, uh, for some reason chose to drop dead the year before I joined the faculty there. Uh, his ghost was still about the corridors when I arrived, and it used to bother me a little bit. Uh, uh, someone said that he complained of a, of a, of a bad headache uh, to the secretary, and then he dropped dead. So for years, when I w- went to teach at the University of Washington, whenever I developed a headache, I would begin to worry quite a lot. But uh, <laughs> I managed to get off of that faculty before I had a massive heart attack. Uh, but uh, Tebow wrote a famous article uh, in which he talked about the local public finance and how uh, e- even if you had a lot of different units of government uh, and they all provided different kinds of services to the residents of, the, of their, their towns or districts, uh, that you might end up in a situation where all these citizens got exactly the collection of services they wanted from government even though these governments were, as it were, uh, inflexible, you know, and not willing to make concessions to what people wanted. But people would just move around and relocate themselves in those areas where, where the local government happened to provide things uh, that they valued more and, and flee from those places they found most disagreeable. 
Now, there's no, there's no doubt that that kind of voting with the feet takes place. I, I've done it myself uh, more than once uh, to get into different jurisdictions. Uh, in my case, I did it to get out of the Seattle School District because my child was going to school in, in the government schools, and, and I was taking intolerable offense at the way he was being treated. So I moved to another district, and, and that worked out a lot better for him and me. Uh, and millions of Americans have made moves for that exact reason, and, and many others. And of course, this kind of voting with the feet operates internationally. Uh, many people have migrated to another nation state where they consider their prospects better or the, their freedoms fuller. And, and we like to tell ourselves in the United States that that's why those 30 million Europeans once picked up and left their homes and came over here uh, to find freedom. But, uh, okay, so you can, you can vote with your feet. Uh, it's costly. Even local move is costly. International move is very costly, especially for people who don't know the language of the place they're going, uh, the customs, the laws. Uh, that doesn't make it impossible. Millions of them do it anyhow and manage to succeed or even thrive, uh, but it makes it costly. Uh, and whenever we raise the cost of anything, uh, we discourage it to some extent. So a uh, question exists as to how much effect we can have in restraining government uh, by uh, people's voting with their feet. Uh, sometimes we can, we can have a lot of effect, I think. That's why the Berlin Wall was built in the first place, is because Germans were voting with their feet and le leaving East Berlin, uh, so they just uh, physically stopped them from doing it. Uh, a few were so intent on leaving that they they took in unbelievable measures to leave nonetheless at risk of life and, and limb. Uh, another way that Tebow-type competition can operate doesn't require anybody to move himself, uh, but involves the movement of other resources. And a lot of people have talked in recent decades about international capital markets, particularly as electronic funds transfers uh, were developed and, and made accessible very easily, even to individuals. So that now, with a click of a mouse, you can move your investments around the world. And some people do that all the time. Uh, it, it does require some investment in, in either getting an expert to help you do it or in learning how to do it yourself. So it's not something everybody is prepared to do this afternoon, uh, but it's not that tough. Uh, uh, there's an interesting book uh, by Dwight Lee and, uh, and Richard McKenzie called Quicksilver Capital, published in the uh, early 1990s. And at that time, they were arguing that indeed the uh, growth of government was slowing, and the main uh, thing that was slowing uh, the growth of government was that people were just removing their wealth from jurisdictions uh, that uh, taxed uh, people too heavily or regulated them too abusively uh, or acted in some other way they didn't like. So they just, uh, as it were, packed up their capital and went elsewhere. Well, uh, again, I don't have any doubt that that, to some extent, serves as a counterforce uh, to restrain governments uh, from abusing people. The question is, how much does it restrain governments? And in what way does it restrain them? And uh, how much effect does it have? Uh, I, uh, I criticized the uh, Quicksilver Capital book at the time, and I really haven't changed my mind about why I criticized it. I think they just put way too much weight on that argument. Uh, ultimately, uh, many of these uh, forms of resource mobility uh, can be squashed by government when governments decide that they really need to squash them. They can either build a Berlin Wall or, or if, say, they don't like you transferring 
uh, your capital electronically, and uh, they, the law they pass forbidding it <laughs> is not a law you're obeying. Uh, they may try to just uh, send an agent into your house and arrest you or or come with a baseball bat and, and, and uh, do a job on your computer. So that uh, governments ultimately have coercive force, and if worse comes to worse, they can deploy that coercive force. So it's all wonderful to think that we're, we're freely sitting at our computer monitors, and, and that makes us free citizens of the world, because what can government do? And the answer is they can always kill us. Uh, and if uh, they feel seriously threatened enough, they will do so. They're willing to do that. A lot of Americans, I think, don't face up to the murderous capability of their own rulers. These people will kill. And they won't just kill foreigners either. They will kill people right here uh, if they feel uh, that the great need will be served by doing so. So uh, I think these arguments about quicksilver capital and voting with the feet have some force, but they also have some limits, and we have to recognize those limits. Uh, these, these people have the biggest scam in the history of the world in the United States. Look at how much they rake in every year. Close to 40% of the national income of the United States is taken into the hands of government officials. That is such a gigantic sum of wealth that it boggles the mind. They take it in year after year after year and use it for their purposes at our expense. And they're not going to just stop doing that because we take offense. Um, so we've got serious problems here with relying on Tebow-type competition. Well, ultimately, uh, everything, as Hume told us, rests on public opinion. Uh, as I've myself argued, uh, none of this would work as it does, but for the dominant ideology. Well, ideologies can change. Why not this one? Some of us might say that's what we're trying to do indeed. That's, uh, that's how we spend our days, in a sense, is working toward a change in the dominant ideology that has brought uh, these conditions into effect. Uh, I certainly accept that uh, ideologies can change. I'm inclined to think that they rarely change quickly uh, for large groups of people. Uh, even for individuals, ideological change is normally a gradual process in which more and more one becomes unhappy with one's old set of beliefs and decides that there's a preferable way to understand the world and evaluate it. So ideological change, uh, I don't think, is, uh, is, is ever something that on a large scale happens quickly. Uh, but it's possible that slow accumulating ideological change even eventually becomes great enough that it alters the character of a dominant ideology or replaces it with a new one. It's happened before. The dominant ideology of this country circa 1885 was totally different from the dominant ideology uh, circa 1945, and even more so from today. Uh, so we know ideological change can take place. It may take 50 years. It may take 100 years. The question then becomes, what would make it change? <laughs> I've tried to argue how some of the historical events, some of the ideological occurrences, uh, importations even, uh, in the past led to the kind of ideological change that occurred in this country. Well, how is the ideological change of the future, if there's to be one, going to come about? Uh, maybe maybe you all will make it happen. I hope so. I hope so. Well, let me stop there. We've got uh, some time for questions and comments. It's uh
it's it's been as it turned out a lot of fun to talk to you uh, this week and uh, and so let have at it if you uh, if you want to lambast me for what I've been saying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, can you uh, confirm or deny reports uh, <laughs> circulating that you are quote linked to terrorism? <laughs> I deny those reports categorically. <laughs> uh, second of all, I, I came across this uh, book in a library um, called Crisis in Leviathan, um, and I wanted to read a short section to see if you could comment on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says, we must have government. Mm-hmm. Um, only government can perform certain tasks successfully. Mm-hmm. Without government to defend us from external aggression, preserve domestic order, define and enforce property rights, few of us could achieve much. And um, so just in, in light of all that we've learned this week, I was uh, <laughs> wondering how a statement like that could be. Uh, <laughs> I was just paraphrasing Ludwig von Mises, uh, <laughs> and uh, I defer to his authority. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, the easy way out would be to say, that was written by my evil twin. <laughs> uh, I think I stand by the statement, but I understand it in a different way than I did when I wrote it. Uh, when I wrote it, I understood it in, in, in a straightforward way that probably most readers would. Uh, when I referred to government, I referred to the kind of government we're used to, the, the actual kinds that uh, exist and operate in the world. Uh, I still think that, that uh, we need government to perform those tasks. Uh, I think there's a, uh, a legitimate, honest, real demand uh, for uh, some agency, uh, some someone who specializes in those tasks to undertake them. Uh, I, 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 I've learned a few things uh, in the past uh, 17 or 18 years since I wrote those words, and uh, I, na- I now have greater uh, conviction that that the government we we need uh, to perform those tasks uh, might conceivably be one that would that would rest on a very different basis from the governments that actually operate in the world that would that would be uh, more more like uh, a government we hired to perform those services or contracted with in a, an open and explicit way that is to say we would have go- a government by the consent of the government governed in a very lit- literal sense. It wouldn't be this kind of metaphorical, uh, oh yes, uh, we have government by the consent of the governed in the United States. Well, I never gave my consent. Why wasn't I asked? I mean, they, they, they enforced their laws on me and they forced me to pay tribute, but I never consented to this. And, and, and who did? Uh, none of us ever consented to this. Uh, we found ourselves in this situation, and, and we've kind of made our calculations and decided to tolerate it, all things considered. But that's very different from, from uh, uh, consenting to it. So uh, I, I think uh, pe- people need government and want government, but they, uh, they don't have to have the kind of coercive, imposed, oppressive apparatus that did the governments of the world we live in uh, amount to. Karen? You said in your first lecture that uh, if you go back in time, there's a lot you would change in this book, especially mm-hmm. the first few chapters. Right. Are you going to do an updated uh, edition like at some point in time? I, I doubt it. Uh, I, I thought about it, and I've been collecting information since, since that book itself was written to, uh, as it were, revise it. Um, I'm just skeptical that I'll ever have the opportunity to do that, and, and, and a little skeptical, too, about whether it's a good idea. I will have two books uh, coming out next year, uh, which are collections of papers, uh, all of which bear in some way on the themes of this book, and will, I think, be seen by anyone who's read this book as, as obvious sequels. Uh, almost everything in those two collections uh, was written after I wrote this book, and and so uh, 
my mind was already working along those lines, but as I've just indicated, I, I've learned a few things, and I've worked on some new topics, and I've, I've pursued some of the subjects I touched on in the book much more thoroughly. Uh, so the, I think these volumes will will have to substitute for a revised edition of Crisis and Leviathan. Mark? Bob, I wanted to ask you about something that's really not in your theory of the growth of government, mm -hmm. but it relates to the crisis. Uh, most Americans view these crises as being exogenous or random events. Right. But now the balance of information and evidence suggests that our leaders actually caused these crises or egged these crises on. You know, the Spanish didn't attack the main. Right. Wilson lied us into World War I. The Fed caused the Great Depression. Roosevelt was responsible for Pearl Harbor. I'd like to go on and on. But, uh, you know, what, what possible role could that get us out of this cycle if Americans were more aware of true causes of these crises, like September 11th. Yeah. Uh, some of us hope that if we can make people more aware of what has happened historically, then we can moderate this sheep-like behavior that characterizes their response to any given crisis. If people weren't going to respond so readily as they always do to uh, the occurrence of a crisis, then there'd be no profit. In, in creating a crisis for uh, the rulers. Uh, they'd get nothing out of it. In fact, they might be blamed. <laughs> uh, it might be unprofitable for them and therefore restrain them from doing it. Uh, so I, I, I believe that it's important to try to give people a better understanding of what has happened in history and, and, uh, and how our leaders ha have not been innocent bystanders as the, the series of great crises came along. They weren't just bolts from the blue at all. Uh, and uh, if we can imagine making some headway in that educational effort, then I think it will have an effect. Uh, it seems to me that these kinds of educational efforts ebb and flow. And they depend, I think, not so much on the efforts of, of those of us who are trying to do the education as on the receptivity of uh, the people we're trying to educate. Uh, if, we, if we go back, say, to, to the 1960s, uh, even though there are many things that, the, that, that all of us dislike about that time, the, the, the general uh, pro, profusion of anti-authority feeling uh, that characterized the 60s was actually a good thing for re restraining the government. Uh, unfortunately, some of the, the people who pretended to be against authority turned out to be just some species of leftist who, who really was willing to buy into authority if used for purposes they approved of. But uh, still, I think it's true that in, in the days when people had bumper stickers say, saying things like, uh, uh, question authority or uh, defy authority. Uh, uh, that, that was fertile ground uh, for us to make our arguments. Uh, on other occasions, the ground is very hard, uh, and it's almost hopeless to go out and try to persuade people to see the light because they're just uh, hell-bent on uh, following, uh, even if the leaders are taking them over the cliff. And, what you said about education. People are educated to worship the state from the time they're five years old and sent to public school. So, I, don't, I mean, these kind of things are great, but we're all adults. And but these kids who go and they're raised by, you know, in the schools by and taught in the schools by people who, who um, get paid by the state to uh, spread the curriculum of the state. I, I mean, <laughs> we went to those schools. <laughs> that's what we were taught to. And we don't believe in that. You went to those schools, and you are what is called by the mainstream a member of the lunatic friend. <laughs> Dan? Well, yeah, um, actually, uh, yeah. going off of what was just said, actually, um, as, as far as questioning authority goes, that can be beneficial to the extent of questioning government authority. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if there are other authorities that might be opposing the government, whether churches or something, it seems like questioning authority can actually be counterproductive in those instances. And that really leads to my question, which is, um, what hope do you think there is of forming some sort of institutional base 
some sort of um, sort of a cultural um, counter countermeasures against the state. For example, a homeschooling seems like right. a good um, yeah. a good tendency that's going to undermine the state a little bit at least, uh, and perhaps other things as well, um, mm -hmm. alternative media, uh, perhaps. Uh, things like that, just institutional. Right. <laughs> well, I think there's some hope. Uh, indeed, I think education may be one of those few places where the hope is significant because the failure of the government schooling system is so utter and complete and atrocious that it's almost impossible for anybody to pretend that it's anything else. Uh, and as a result, a lot of people have been willing to at least listen to proposals for making changes or reforms of some kind. Now, unfortunately, uh, many of the reforms that have been put forward are the kind of, uh, of measures that, that don't uh, uh, cut to the, to the ground. Uh, uh, vouchers, for example, seem like a great uh, proposal, uh, except that the, the, the very real danger attaches to them that uh, that not only will they, they, they not work very well to do what w uh, people want them to do, but at the same time, they will kill uh, that little remnant of genuinely private schooling that exists right now because the minute a school accepts a student uh, with a, with a government-issued voucher, it's going to make itself subject to all the rules that will come along as strings t tied to that voucher. And uh, it'll be very tempting. Many of these uh, private schools struggle financially. They'll be very tempted to accept voucher students if, if such students exist and come to them. And, and they will, at, for certain, I'm sure, many of them find themselves hogtied and uh, be made de facto government schools at arm's length. And, and uh, I, I don't favor vouchers for that reason. But uh, I think homeschooling is, is an important uh, counter trend in, in education. Genuinely private schooling is all for the best. Um, uh, if, if some way could be found to, to get people to just say, what we want is to, is to eliminate school taxes and then just let people do what they will. At least they won't be forced to pay taxes to schools they may not want. If they still want to take their kids down to the to the government school, all right, they can go down there and turn around and pay a fee, what what would have been collected in taxes, for example, uh, and send them there. But at least they would have the option, uh, and and the choice would really be freely theirs rather than already rigged uh, somehow and made part of a system that would be, insinuate government control into what had been privately controlled before. Now, there, there, there are any number of other kinds of uh, uh, political and cultural initiatives we can imagine that are anti-statist in, in thrust, and uh, I think the more the better. You know, we all have varied interests, uh, we all have varied knowledge, and, and what I, I think will work best is that if we can make anti-statism a kind of counterculture widespread in its own right, if we can somehow just get people to, to immediately rat, react to the idea that government is doing anything, whether it's X, Y, or Z, with the, with the idea, well, that's stupid, how, how could we do that in some other better way? Uh, then we would have the problem half solved already, because once people are able to cut their thinking free of dependency on government, uh, then the world is full of creative, knowledgeable people capable of performing all kinds of miracles. <laughs> uh, we don't know what is possible in a free society. I, I mean, it's glorious to imagine. But, uh, but so long as people can't allow themselves to imagine those possibilities, we're never going to find out. So, so I, I'm, I'm all inclined to let a thousand flowers bloom.